I first heard about it on the BBC News going home um, and five o'clock news and they talked about this new discovery which is going to change the world of particle physics and how we understand the universe and I'm going oh and they talked about the uh, how the electron is a perfect sphere and I'm thinking well what, what experiment is this it's and gradually as they talked a little bit more I realized it's I knew what the experiment was and I even know the people who have done it and they were my colleagues in Sussex and so uh, I know Johnny Hudson and Ed Hines very well and Ben Sauer and so it was really great to hear about the experiment I'd never thought about it as being the electron is a sphere I'd thought about it as the electron dipole moment somehow I don't think if they'd have talked about the electric dipole moment of the electron that might not have made the BBC news I, I can't give you the heavy experimental details because it's too complicated for a theorist like myself but I can tell you some of the background first of all why, why say the electron is a, a sphere when we we think of the electron actually as a fundamental particle it's one of the building blocks of, 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 of uh, the standard model and normally you think of that as a point-like object so what does it mean to say it's a sphere and I think what they're really talking about is the charge the electron's got a charge uh, an electric charge and, and they're talking about the distribution of that charge they've measured it to be almost spherical and in fact to show the precision of their experiment they've demonstrated that that distribution if, if they could scale it up to the size of the solar system then it would be a sphere to within a hair's breadth they could measure a deviation of a hair's width so a, a sphere the size of the solar system they could measure a deviation of that charge distribution of a hair's width it turns out that the that distribution of the charge around the electron is, is, is really important in understanding the nature of the matter antimatter asymmetry the fact that we live in a universe made up mainly of matter very little antimatter around and yet we believe in the early universe they were created in equal amounts so what has happened and the by finding this a deviation of of this charge from this the perfectly spherical charge you we would hopefully gain some information about this origin of this matter antimatter asymmetry so let me step back before I go into those details and perhaps just talk a little bit about the what what it means to be not spherical so so a spherical distribution of charge basically the way I think about it anyway is that if you happen to have a, a, a detector that could pick up charge could measure charge then if, if my electron is here then the detector would pick up an equal amount of charge on this side as it would on this side as it would up and down and all the way around it would be perfectly spherical it wouldn't see any uh, preferential distribution of charge that's called a monopole by the way where it where it's equally distributed like that a spherical distribution now the next thing you can do you can if you want to distort this charge is the next simplest one is called a dipole and uh, we're used to dipoles at school we're used to dipoles magnetic dipoles a bar magnet right has a south pole and a north pole and we're used to that in, in magnetic uh, cases but it also exists in the electric case if I had a positive electric charge and a negative electric charge then the dipole would be and put them close to one another the dipole would be a line that goes from the negative to the positive charge right so this is so the electrons only got a negative charge so it turns out that you don't have to have a positive and a negative charge to have a have a, a dipole you just need to have a, a distribution of the charge which is not spherical so if for example I, I distorted this sphere so I made it so that it may be more like a, a, um, a raindrop okay which has got a bul a bulgous end at one bit and a narrow end at the other so there's more charge over here and less charge over here then I would have a dipole going from from one one part to the other part that's what they're looking for that's what this experiment is looking for with the electron they're looking for this asymmetry in the charge and things that cause this asymmetry are the interaction of the electron with the other particles now in the standard model of particle physics the one that describes the universe as well as we know it the we there is an asymmetry it's induced by the interaction between the electrons and the quarks actually but it's so small it's expected to be unobservable so the fact that it hasn't been seen is no surprise 
But we know that the standard model of particle physics can't descri doesn't describe everything. So there, there are extra modifications called beyond the standard model which people have put forward. There are lots of variants. And one of the goals of places like the LHC is to test these models. And what's wonderful, one of the wonderful things about this experiment is A, it's also testing these models, but B, it's in a lab. Much lower energies, just in a lab down at Imperial College with uh, Ed Hines and his group. And what they're looking for then is the interaction between some of these new particles, in, in particular supersymmetric particles they're called, they're the partners of the particles that we, that we know exist. They're looking for the possible interaction between those particles and the electron. And, and the theories predict that in some of those cases you expect them to induce this as asymmetry. And what they've managed to demonstrate is through you know, months and months, in fact years of working on this, is that there is no asymmetry. They've, they've, even though they've got their sensitivity down and down and down and down, the electron distribution of the charge still seems perfectly spherical. They're seeing no deviation. That then means that those models which predict there should be a deviation that's already in excess of what has been seen are ruled out. It doesn't rule out supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is a vast subject and, and there are lots of regions of, of parameters in supersymmetry which you can still go to which would be perfectly consistent with the observation of, of, of no distortion. But it's severely constraining it. What the experiment is, is so you've got to create this dipole. You've got to, you're trying to test for this dipole moment. Well, basically they put electrons in, a, in an electric field. But if you were to simply put an electron in an electric field, you've created a little accelerator. It's your cathode ray tube, it's your television, it shoots out and you've lost it. So what they do is they put, they look at molecules, um, molecules of ytterbium fluoride. Okay, <laughs> fluoride, of, fluorine I've heard of, incredibly reactive. Apparently the ytterbium's heavy, a heavy an atom of ytterbium's very heavy. We need Martin. <laughs> an, an atom of fluorine is very light. So it itself already has, remember what I talked about, the, the, the distribution of the, of the electric, it produces an electric dipole moment in its own right. And so the electrons are already enhanced by just being in the presence of this, these molecules. So they put these molecules in, then they apply an electric field. That shifts the energy level of the electrons. Then they switch the electric field and the energy levels shift again. Now, the amount of shifting of, these, of the energy of the electrons actually depends upon the dipole moment. So the bigger the shift of the electrons, the bigger the dipole moment. So that's what they're looking for. They're looking to measure the shift and they can double it up by reversing the field so that it goes from positive to negative, so it increases the range. And that's what they've been looking for. They've been, they've been looking for that shift and they've seen no evidence of that shift. In, in their um, analysis, they have, they, look, they have all of these data, all this data. And of course, it's all done on the computer as well. They're analyzing it all on the computer. So there is a box there or a screen which will constantly be giving them the electric dipole moment. But they cover it up, right? They've had it covered up because they don't want to be influenced by the, by the, as they're trying to reduce all their errors, they don't want to sort of be influenced and, and have a quick look and say, oh, if we just tweak that a bit more, we'll get this down. And, and it's very important you do that, that you, it must have been so difficult for them not to go and have a quick peek to see what they were seeing. And what they do is they eventually reach a stage where they think that they've basically accounted for everything they can possibly account for over that, you know, in a sensible time period and uh, they pull the screen off. They pull the, the cover off the screen and they look. And I, I saw Ed Hines yesterday, I was on a panel with him and I asked him what, what it was like and he said, they pulled it off, they had a meeting, they said, is, is it time? First time round, there was disagreement, people thought they could still work on a few more systematics and eventually the group said, yes, let's do it. Pulled it off, saw the result, it was there, opened a bottle of champagne and uh, the world got to hear about it. <laughs>